Everson and Phil McCoy on Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. As we welcome back our co-host, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield, two-star. With cats. You have cats, Bill? No, I don't have I, I didn't think so. Uh, also, uh, New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap. Cats or no cats? I hate cats. <laughs> Just hate cats. I did not go that far, John. Just, My don't. father-in-law hates cats. I, of all the things to hate in life, there's so many things out there that are worth hating. Why cats? I, I, I just don't. I don't like them. What is it? Well, I don't. Well, first of all, I'm really allergic to them, and they okay. know. It. As they is know. My wife. So yes. if I if they if, do, there'll be 30 people in a room, and the cat will come up. And sit in my lap just yeah. to make me sneeze. Does that to my wife too? And a Facebook account is just bombed. Everybody's coming in fussing at John with supporting cats. I was on a panel at BoucherCon a couple of years uh, ago. BoucherCon. BoucherCon, yeah. <laughs> and there are a lot of cats. Come on, bro. I've done worse. <laughs> <laughs> Many times. <laughs> And there are a lot of cat lovers among mystery readers. And yeah, I that said, makes sense. I said something disrespectful about cats. And? Oh. The room turned on you. And you could feel it. <laughs> you know? It, like, you you kind of do it. You have to do a shtick, and people are with you, and they're laughing. And I did yeah. one cat joke. It and was that like, was the end. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and you can't, it's a hole you can't dig out of, so you just sit there quietly and let the other panelists do their thing. I'm not a cat person, but I don't hate them. Well, I don't. Th- I don't hurt them. You know, it's not like I. Except I, Mr. I Jinx. Have a... Mr. Jinx was my uh, friend Sean Sweeney's cat when I, when we were kids. And if you went and touched anywhere near where Mr. Jinx sat, he would take out those claws and slice you. And he would just keep going at you until you got away from that chair. He was just a mean, mean cat. I had a uh, uh, colleague call me late at night, uh, Saturday night which I took great exception to because it's so late. But 9.30? Re- <laughs> no, it was, it was after that. Uh, a couple minutes. <laughs> but but the, I found out later the reason he's calling me that his little dog, little Chihuahua dog, had gotten in a fight in the back of their yard with a Siamese cat. And the Ooh. Siamese cat had literally pulled an eye out of the dog. Oh. And so they oh. were trying to find a vet that would... Uh, uh, be able to put the eye back. And now in. that dog is a pirate. Is that what you're going to do? I, the, yeah, with a patch on one oh, eye. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Our, our guest is John Everson from the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. John, good morning. Gentlemen, good morning. And let me get the uh, the question of the day. Uh, let's, let's, let's tackle it right up front out of the starting blocks. Uh, I do not have a cat. Um, my wife and I are not a cat people. It's not that we dislike them. Mm-hmm. We are. Uh, we have a grand cat, if I can say it that way. Yeah. Uh, John Gilstrap will appreciate uh, the story I'm about to tell, which is several years ago, our daughter and son-in-law bought a house. The house conveyed with a cat. <laughs> and what had happened, the folks that had owned the house previously uh, moved out, moved away, moved out of state, uh, left their, their cat uh, on the front porch. When they departed, and uh, uh, weeks, months later, our daughter and son-in-law buy this house, and uh, you know they go to closing. They're excited. Let's go, go see our new house and so forth. Uh, they get out there, and um, there's this emaciated cat uh, on the front porch. Just you know, so they had a bottle of water with them. They gave this this cat a drink, and it just you know drank the entire bottle of water. So our daughter calls the office, hey, Mom, Dad, are you guys going to run over uh, to see the house after you guys leave the office this afternoon? Well, yeah, we had planned to. Why? Uh, we need a favor. Swing by the supermarket and buy us some cat food. And we're like, what are you talking about? She said, you'll see when you get here. Our daughter is allergic to cats. So, oh, no. But Ozzy now has a nice home. They've, they've adopted him. He's, he's now an inside cat. And uh, I think our daughter uh, goes for uh, periodic shots to uh, counterbalance the uh, the allergy that she has to cats. But yes, bought a house that conveyed with a cat. I've never heard of that before. First and foremost, uh, no respect for people who abandon their pets. No, agreed. Uh, no, agreed. no respect for that whatsoever. That's that's terrible. Uh, and then, really, quite magnanimous of your daughter with cat allergies to accept the cat instead of taking it to the Humane Society. That's pretty uh, that, impressive. That I agree with. And here, here's, here's the funniest thing about this is um, 
since you know, of course, the, the, you know, they buy the house, the the cat, you know, adopts this new family. Hey, welcome to my home, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you guys moved in with me. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> well, that's the, how cats um, are. By the way, that's yeah. my room, not yours. <laughs> yes, you know, exactly. And then the cat does kind of, hey, no, 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 this this is my space. You guys go over there. Anyway, what's really interesting, uh, we now have a granddaughter that's a year and a half old. That cat is, if uh, our granddaughter, of course, she's still, you know, uh, kind of pre-toddler at this point. But when she was an infant, when she would start to cry, because Ozzy would hang out in the nursery. If she would, was taking a nap, whatever, would start to cry. He would come to find Emily and would let her know, hey, that baby needs attention. And uh, very protective of our granddaughter is this cat. So cool. uh, have, that's have not what the cat was doing. <laughs> the cat was saying, Hey, this creature is annoying me. It's annoying me. <laughs> Do yeah, something exactly. about it. <laughs> no, they got a guard exactly. cat. <laughs> You're making enemies in our Facebook comment section. Gil Strap. I'm telling you right now. Oh, mercy. Hey, and, yeah, hey, hey, real quick. Yep. And if they, if, if they want to vilify a John, remember it's not John Everson. It's, it's just John, the cat. John Gilstrap. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 there you go. Okay. Good, good <laughs> distinction made, John. And for those yeah. of you who may not know this or perhaps uh, no longer recall it, John Everson was also known as Coach Everson for a while, too. I, I was for about a decade yeah. locally. That is, that is a true statement. Hey, have you guys uh, followed weather in um, uh, other parts of the world where uh, uh, Phil McCoy and um, – uh, a number of volleyball athletes <laughs> happen to be located. Have you guys followed that at all? Uh, how How is the forecast in Hawaii? 85 and sunny? No, no typhoon. No. Typhoon. Oh, too. no. Yes, yeah. typhoon. Just, yes, uh, tropical just... storm, typhoon. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, uh, so... But it's uh, it's 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 a, a, not a strong one. It's, I think, a Category 1 or 2. Uh, but still causing a lot of damage, both wind damage and, and rain. So, oh. yeah, I was going to say, so a foot of rain is really yeah. nothing to be concerned yeah. about, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, it's the irony if, um, you know, because Phil's daughter plays uh, for one of the local high schools, uh, they've, uh, they're, they're competing in a uh, tournament in, um, in Hawaii, which is the reason why Phil is not here this morning, because I guess it's what, 2 a.m., uh, something like that, between mm -hmm. 2 and 3 in the morning, you know, uh, his time. And uh, so I said, yeah, I, you know, I, I can fill in for you on Monday. That's not a problem. And uh, I didn't know anything about this until yesterday at church. Someone said, hey. Have you, uh, you seen the weather where Phil and his family are headed? And I'm like, no. I, again, I'm thinking, you know, 80 degrees and mild and temperate and, you know, beautiful and, you know, Hawaii. tropical. Yeah. And apparently anything but. Yeah. So, which yeah. island are they on? To them. Which island? They're on, um, yeah, they're on the, uh, the big island. The big island. Uh, so, okay. yeah. yes. Yes. So, and apparently Hilo was uh, like a, a, you know, a, a sort of a, a bullseye for that yeah. first storm that had uh, had moved across. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think there may be another one headed that way. So, Darn. you know, hopefully everybody is safe and uh, they uh, they make it back. Uh, uh, hopefully volleyball is the most exciting thing that they deal with. We'll put it that way. Amen. John, looking at uh, futures markets right now, the Dow and the S&P slightly higher, NASDAQ. Yep. Slightly lower. We had a pretty good indication last week that the Fed is going to begin cutting interest rates. And I, I guess the question now is, what will they start with, a quarter point, a half a point, what? Yeah, you know, so, so Rob, yeah, good, good question. Uh, and here's what's really interesting. There's been so much anticipation about that all year. And, I, you know, actually going back almost a year ago when they had said, announced, you know, probably sometime in 2024, we anticipate, you know, numerous rate cuts and so forth, because we anticipate, you know, inflation, you know, being, you know, uh, relatively under control, dialed back and so forth. And so right now, I think, you know, any move that they make, I think is probably going to be read in a bit of a positive light. I don't know if you guys saw this or not. There was a report that was released on, um, I think it came out Friday, that talked about the number of uh, pending home sales that had collapsed during after a contract had been signed. So in the month of July, uh, there was a record number of home sales that potential buyers had backed out of. And there was a lot of speculation with regard to, you know, why did that occur? And if I'm not mistaken, I think that was the most, the the, the highest number of um, people pulling out of a home purchase agreement 
in uh, either in many, many, many years or may, maybe in history. I don't, I don't know that for a fact. Here's what's interesting, though, because when I started thinking about that, I thought, well, that doesn't surprise me at all. Number one, you've got the Fed continuing to talk about soon we're going to lower interest rates. Well, there's, there's going to be a ripple effect back on the mortgages as a result of that move, okay? So why would I go ahead and, you know, finalize this, this, this purchase now if the Fed, you know, next month is going to lower interest rates for, you know, two months out, you know, from, from the month of July? Why would I go ahead and commit now, number one? Number two, we got one of our presidential candidates talking about a $25,000, uh, I think it's a first-time home buyer, if I'm not mistaken, uh, purchase credit. Well, if, if the government's going to give me money to purchase a home – at potentially lower rates, why would I commit now? And so I think one of the things that we're seeing right now is there's just a lot of um, anxiousness, a lot of uneasiness with regard to a lot of things that are going on. Fed has a, a play in some of that. Uh, politics, you know, presidential campaign and comments made from, from a podium are beginning to weigh in on some things. So I think right now we're just seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, erratic kind of behavior uh, driven by some of these underlying factors. John, I have a fear that if that $25,000 credit goes into effect, it's going to have a similar effect to what the government backing student loans had on the cost of a college education. I, I, I got a hunch you're right. So think about this. All of our houses are about to go up by $25,000, right? Right. Because on a competitive basis, the pricing on the new ones, it's just going to get marked up. And again, I, I, I'm one of these guys where, I, again, I'm a bit of a, a believer in free market, you know, that government needs to keep their money, you know, instead of trying to influence things and so forth. Let's not have, you know, uh, programs like that. I'm not a big fan because the only thing that that truly does create is a, a ripple effect back onto the price of, you know, the, there's going to be a markup of at least 25000 on every uh, home, you know, that's listed on the market then at that point. Speaking of the market, we are just about at the end of August. How so far has the month of August been for the major indices, John? Yeah, so if you guys remember, I was on, I think it was three weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, in the, um, uh, the Monday that I was on a couple of weeks ago, at the beginning of the month, uh, late the prior week and that weekend overseas, we had absolutely been just, you know, beaten up. In fact, if you remember, I used the, the, the fact that I was already beginning to read words plunge and plummet in media reports right. and so forth, talking about equity markets and such and, you know, all the silliness that that was uh, creating. So we went from, by the time we got to about the, uh, the, the 5th or 6th of August, it looked like this is going to be an absolutely horrible month. We reversed that, and we are now positive month to date on pretty much, uh, you know, across the board on uh, any index that you measure right now. So, and again, I think a lot of this goes back to, you know, I've always said this. Of course, you know, again, think about this, fellas. I've been doing this now. I'm, uh, I'm in year 39. So in March of, of uh, this coming spring, I will begin my 40th a year, four decades of having uh, done this, I've been through a number of presidential uh, elections. And what's interesting is that the way I've always described them is most presidential elections for financial markets, those years are relatively benign. And what I mean by that is they typically are years where they're fairly mild, they're fairly favorable, uh, they're not uh, particularly harmful to the uh, either the incumbent or the existing administration, and so forth. You know, they're they're trying to keep from you know you know kind of rocking the boat, and they don't want you know uh, a real uh, real erratic kind of event. So, you know, what we saw at the beginning of this month is where it was was really volatile for a couple of days. That has totally reversed itself, and all of a sudden, people have forgotten, you know, what was taking place just three weeks ago. Billy. Yeah. Good morning, John. Uh, morning. Are the uh, the market does not seem to have responded to the suggestion of a rate cut, either a quarter or a half a percent. Uh, two questions. One, do you anticipate the market will respond once a rate cut is is identified? What the level? And second question: Will there be certain sectors that will benefit? 
Yeah, good question. I think uh, 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 the fir- first answer to your first one is uh, I think that that cut has been so anticipated that an awful lot of what of, of that move has already been baked in. I think a lot of that has already been accounted for. Okay, we may see though when that announcement actually happens, we'll probably see a little bit of a surge in equity markets because all of a sudden everything becomes cheaper. Okay. Response to your second question is, you know, you think about this, any, any kind of a product that is uh, interest rate sensitive, you know, obviously large items, so whether it's houses, automobiles, um, remodelings, things of, of that nature, anything where that typically where people are making those purchases with borrowed funds, uh, I think you'll start to see a little bit of a, a, a lift, a little bit of a pickup in some of, uh, some of those sectors. Uh, combined then with, uh, I wouldn't be a bit surprised, but what we start to see just a, a broader influence as well, because as, as you know, the cost of accessing capital becomes less expensive for any kind of a business, and I don't care whether you are, you know, at the, uh, the very beginning of, of the production cycle, like a farmer is, or you're at the end of the production cycle, like, say, a, uh, an automobile assembly plant would be, any time you have cheaper capital, suddenly the cost of your entire operation becomes um, a little more affordable, and it's not as, uh, not as expensive to operate. So I think eventually we'll start to see that ripple its way back through just the economy as a whole. John, my wife has a TSP account. She works for the federal government. So yeah. she's in a few different funds, S&P 500 index fund, a small cap fund. And the small cap funds, when the interest rates were low, were doing really well. But yes, they were. since the rates went up, the small caps have lagged the S&P funds greatly. If yes. interest rates then are cut over the next two to three years, as been indicated by Chairman Powell, can we expect that a small cap index fund would then respond in kind and, and start to compete with the S&P 500 better? Yeah, and that kind of ties back, Rob, to a little bit of what I was just saying. Any time uh, cost of capital becomes more affordable, uh, just think about this. You know, the, the, the large, uh, well-capitalized, uh, typically multinational firms, you know, in many instances, you know, they, they can operate – uh, pretty efficiently. They're not uh, heavily dependent upon someone else's money to operate. Generally, the small caps, the, the smaller your capitalization, the more dependent you become on, uh, uh, you know, uh, financed uh, funds. And so any time that uh, the cost of borrowed money becomes uh, more achievable and more affordable, that's probably going to, uh, there, you would anticipate a bit of a lift for those, uh, those smaller businesses because it's, again, anytime you can uh, reduce, reduce some of that, that operating cost, that eventually is going to start to show up on the bottom line, and there, uh, there tends to be a benefit because of that. I hear a siren in the background. Gilstrap, by nature, hears that like Pavlov's dog. He wants to run out and put out a fire somewhere. Yeah, well, it's funny. I was, I was, uh, I, I wear a wireless headset, and I was uh, walking around my office, and when that that siren got flipped on right outside the office, I, I ran back to my phone to hit my mute button really quick. <laughs> but apparently, I didn't make it fast enough. Sorry about that. Oh, that's that's quite all right. We love the flavor. Uh, well, hey, and that, that's that's the advantage or disadvantage, I guess, to being only whatever we are, a quarter of a mile, third of a mile off of Interstate 81 at one of the major interchanges. So oh uh, we tend to get lots of uh, fire trucks and ambulances. They almost always seem to be headed toward uh, 81, it seems like. Yeah, you're pretty much right off exit 12. We are. Yes, indeed, we are. We are, uh, uh, we, we are at the epicenter, what it feels like, of, of Berkeley County, maybe the entire eastern panhandle, because the intersection that is just like, whatever, 150, 200 yards away from our office is one of the busiest places, uh, maybe on the eastern seaboard. That's how it feels on most days. Oh, yeah, but, it's uh, crazy. Nonetheless. Maybe busy, but the traffic does not move. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of traffic through that. That's right. Oh, it's all, yeah, it's, it's all, busy, it's all stopped every time I yeah. try to go through there. No, nobody yeah. goes down there anymore. It's too jammed. Yeah. yeah. The tra- exactly it's it's right. zero or 90. That's it. Mm-hmm. Those are the two, two speeds. speeds. Uh, how important a harbinger is the housing market to the overall economy? Uh, yeah, ho- housing is really important because you think about it. To a large degree, 
And I've often said this, you know, a lot of times, you know, having worked again for decades doing this, I always remind people when they're talking about, well, you know, we're thinking about maybe uh, selling our house and, you know, uh, you know, getting a newer one, uh, whether it's a, a better neighborhood or just a, a newer home or whatever. I always remind them that, look, your f- current furniture may look great in the house that it's in, but all of a sudden, if you've got a new place, now all of a sudden that, that sofa that maybe looked fine where it was doesn't look as good in that new house. And so when you stop and you think about it, housing spurs an awful lot of uh, ancillary uh, purchases that tend to come off of that. So everything from you know, equipping a place, whether it's window treatments and furniture to you know, lawn care equipment, you know, the old push mower that I had on the the postage that I use for the postage stamp size yard, you know, now that I've got a bigger yard, well, I don't want to push mow that anymore. Now I need a, a riding lawn mower and I need a, a weed trimmer and, you know, all of these other things. So housing really is a, a key component because there's so many ancillary uh, products that tend to uh, ripple effect off of housing purchases that it does have a pretty significant effect, uh, effect on the, uh, the economy as a whole. You know, my neighbor, Luis, moved out recently. And as I went by his house, he had one of those big roll-off dumpster carts in his driveway. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was filled with stuff he was throwing out. And I was so envious of him. I was thinking, do I really have that much stuff in my house I don't need? The answer is yes. <laughs> it is yes, absolutely. There's so much stuff you accumulate. Hey, yeah, we, 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 we all do. Yeah. Yes. It just it's occurred- almost, you know, we, we, we ought to be on some kind of like a... Uh, like a 10-year purge cycle you yeah. know it ought to be mandatory every every 10 years you go through and because there's a lot of stuff sometimes that you know still has functionality but maybe we don't use it that much anymore and maybe it could be repurposed to somebody else and would be of, of great benefit to them but yes i i do agree with you rob mm-hmm. uh, my, my wife and i've been in our house for uh 32 32 years now and um I do not look forward to the day <laughs> where we go to relocate because it's like there's just so much stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hey, John, this is political season. I know you do not want to get involved with politics, but does the stability of the Fed chair from one administration to the other administration, is that a positive thing, or should they do, as some suggest, that the Fed chair be turned over with a new administration? Yeah, great question. Um, and the way, uh, Mr. Stubblefield, that I answer all questions that tend to be kind of um, uh, where there's there's kind of ultimately a little bit of a political sort of a uh, an undertone to it, we remind people all the time to, to make sure that they don't let politics affect their strategic allocations and the things that they're doing from a portfolio build and design and management point of view. Okay, uh, now let's go back to your question. You know, and it is interesting because oftentimes, you know, those political appointments, you know, the um, the incoming administration, they want uh, folks who, who uh, tend to reflect their attitudes and outlooks and perspectives on how capital markets should function and operate, availability of, of capital and, and things of that nature. And so, you know, it is one of those where um, – you know, and, and, and we've seen, and I've, I've, I've long said this in this business, we've seen uh, financial markets, we've seen Fed chairs who, uh, I don't care what, your, what, what party they're affiliated with, we've seen them where they've been good on both sides of the aisle. We've seen them where they've been less effective on both sides of the aisle. And again, that's why we try to remind people, look, you know, let's be real careful about uh, making major kind of decisions based on what takes place at the uh, on election day or the appointments that are inevitable that are going to spawn off of uh, those results. John, how do we get in touch with you for more information and uh, questions to be answered yeah. and asked? Our, our office is located near the busiest intersection in all of Martinsburg, <laughs> West Virginia. We're at 1270 Winchester Avenue, uh, just south of the intersection of Winchester Avenue and Apple Harvest Drive. And uh, phone number here at our office is area code 304 263 Four three four three. John, I appreciate you pinch hitting. You're the man. I always enjoy speaking with you. The last question is one that Financial Phil would address. Uh, Steelers should choose who is the starting quarterback, Russell Wilson or Justin Fields? Oh, I'd, I'd have to go with uh, uh, Wilson.
Yes, <laughs> Russell Wilson. O- only is. because of I again the experience, the time. Uh, I, I would go there. Uh, Fields to me uh, still remains a bit of a mystery quality. I'll put it that way. All right, well thought out answer. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. There you go, gentlemen. Thanks. Have a good day.